Let's. Welcome, welcome to everyone. Okay, so today we are going to be talking about challenging odontogenic uh, lesions, which are uh, in a case-based approach to the diagnosis. I think odontogenic lesions are a big deal for us anyways, and uh, it's always good to keep going through them. And uh, Dr. Deepika has some excellent cases she's going to discuss. And with that, let me just get on with their introduction, and then we will go on. So our resource faculty today, the speaker is Dr. Deepika Mishra. She is from the Center of, uh, for Educa Dental Education and Research. She is the professor there at Ames, New Delhi. And uh, she is one of the most active and I would say definitely upcoming stars of oral pathology. It's always a great pleasure to have her with us. And it's a great pleasure to have her here with us today. She's been on this channel before, so you can also find her previous um, video on the channel. Then, as a resource faculty, we have Dr. Soumya Sv. She's a professor and head oral pathology and microbiology, Ramaya Dental College. And I did meet her just yesterday, but it's great to have her here. And I know that she has written a review on the topic and this will make all the difference. So she's going to add to the overall discussion at the end. Yes, Deepika, welcome. And it's all yours. Welcome, Dr. Soumya. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for your kind Welcome. words. Yes, I got. Where is your. Uh, right. Here you are. Okay. So, thank you so much, ma'am, for your very kind words and very encouraging indeed. So, today I'm. Uh, uh, today we'll be talking about the challenging ontogenic lesions. Uh, so I have uh, myself. I'm from uh, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, and in Delhi. And uh, uh, there, we actually our center has been a referral center for all of these jaw lesions, and that's one of the reason why sometimes we do get very interesting cases, uh, which becomes uh, you know sometimes uh, quite dilemmatic when dealing with their own with their diagnosis and uh, those are the cases which i'll be sharing with you all so that they can help uh, you know uh, when you are dealing with such rare entities as well okay so the only thing you can't recycle is wasted time so i will try my best so that i can you know make your uh, 40 minutes from now useful uh, so most uh, mostly, actually, we uh, we do remember uh, about odontogenesis and how auto develops, but I would just like to you know so shortly uh, brief you, uh, so that once we deal with challenging cases, how our basic histology or oral anatomy and histology always always helps us, you know, when we are dealing with any kind of cases which could be challenging or it could be just common cases, but only the basic the knowledge of the basic anatomy and histology always you know sort of helps us and takes us out of all those you know dilemmatic situations so as we remember that how our tooth develops from the dental lamina wherein uh, uh outgrowth which is called as uh, you know uh enamel organ it just starts developing takes on a shape of a cap and that's when it is called as a cap stage and ultimately it it further uh, you know uh, proliferates and leads takes the shape of a bell stage which is actually the most important stage within mostly the morpho differentiation and histo differentiation occurs and um, if you just uh, remember how it is and the bell stage uh, all the inner inner enamel epithelium outer enamel epithelium still reticulum like cells becomes even more prominent. So stiletro reticulum is the one, the cells which are present in between the inner enamel epithelium as well as the outer enamel epithelium. And uh, the stiletro reticulum name comes from the star shape or the stilet shape which they acquire. So as uh, further the growth occurs, uh, the inner enamel epithelium, the cells uh, sort of changes or differentiates into amyloblasts. 
and uh, uh, the mesen kind, which is you know adjacent to uh, this epi enamel organ. So the one which is entrapped inside, we know it's called as ectomesen kind. We start calling it as dental para, and the one which is surrounding the mesen kind, which is surrounding the entire enamel organ as well as ectomesen kind, is called as a dental sac. Uh, so the outer layer of um, uh, ectomesen kind, which comes in contact with the inner enamel epithelium, transforms into odontoblasts, which ultimately lays down dentine, initially pre dentine, and then it transforms into dentine. And inner enamel epithelium, which is transformed into ameloblast, lays down first layer of enamel. So that is how the enamel and dentine starts forming. And um, the, because uh, once the as we know that the enamel is a hard structure, so it sort of stops the nutrition supply, which you know, uh, which uh, uh, enamel organ was deriving from the ectomesen kind, and that's the reason why the outer enamel epithelium is sort of disintegrated. Uh, first, initially, it lays down into folds, and then it disintegrates so that the nutrition is steadily maintained to all the inner layers, which are basically proliferating. Uh, so as the enamel and dentine forms, what happens to the root? So once the tooth starts erupting, the root also starts uh, getting completed. So the outer and the inner enamel epithelium, which uh, sort of joins at the end, so there is no stellar at those particular ends. Uh, so now we start, we call it as a Hertwig epithelial root sheet. It ultimately disintegrates and a uh, sort of connection is uh, maintained between the inner dentine and the ectomesen kind, which ultimately leads to the differentiation of dental sac into cementoblasts and lays down cementum around the dentine. So here we have pulp, uh, which is surrounded by uh, you know, dentine and enamel on the coronal portion. And the radicular or the root portion, you have pulp surrounded by, by dentine and then cementum. So this is the entire, you know, uh, odontogenesis, which leads to formation of normal teeth in the jaws. Uh, when we see these areas in the histology, we have a similar kind of uh, you know, uh, enamel epithelium, which is, these are the buds. When you, see in the radio, when you see in the histology, it looks something like this. And then you have a cap stage, wherein you have an enamel epithelium, ectomesen chyme, and you know, uh, dental sac. Uh, similarly, you have a bell stage here, and then you have a advanced bell, wherein you have an enamel, dentine, and pulp. So this is a normal process of tooth development. And uh, in all in the entire tooth development, you have a lot of pathways, like FJ pathway, uh, you know, sonic hedgehog pathway, a lot of pathways which play an important role in the development of this, starting from the oral epithelium to bud stage, cap, bell, and late bell stage. And there are a lot of molecules which have been found or the gen genes which have been found linked to the entire development process. So uh, what happens uh, uh, to all this um, uh, whenever there is uh, some sort of alteration in or any abnormality or any, you know, uh, anything which falls wrong in the entire pathway or any genes which is soft mutated, uh, all the, the in any alteration in any particular path in the you know in the process of odontogenesis can lead to the formation of odontogenic cystic tumors. So, what is the etiology of cystic tumors? There could be remnants of dental lamina which could be left out in the you know ectomesen kind of the stroma, which can later on under certain stimulus can proliferate and can lead to certain cysts and tumors. Some remnants of Hertwig epithelial root sheath, which is actually responsible for forming root or cementum, can also lead to you know uh, uh, these cystic tumors. Then enamel organ before heart tissue formation, reduced enamel epithelium. Uh, there's been a you know theory stating that basal cells of oral epithelium or deep projections of oral epithelium can also have a role. Now, rarely glandular elements are also found to be associated with their etiology. Uh, there have been various classifications of ontogenic cystic tumors which have kept ch changing over a period of time, starting from 92 to 2005. And now the latest one, which we are following right now, is the 2017, and in which they have 
you know, they have kept changing the position of ontogenic keratocyst and calcifying ontogenic cyst. So ontogenic keratocyst initially was termed as keratocystic ontogenic tumors, but now again it is being included into uh, odontogenic cysts because the evidence is not strong enough to, uh, you know, consider them as tumors. Uh, similarly, with the calcifying ontogenic cysts, which in 2005 were uh, uh, classified under as classifying uh, cystic ontogenic tumors, but now they are back to COC. Uh, why this is important? Because you might get some literature wherein you know you can have these overlapping terms. Uh, then, uh, then the ontogenic cyst of inflammatory origin, you have radical and inflammatory collateral cyst. Similarly, in the tumors, uh, they, uh, they have, you know, uh, sort of included few newer entities like, uh, you know, sclerosing ontogenic carcinoma is one of the entity uh, which mimics dysplastic uh, amyloblastoma. Um, so the way to differentiate is mainly the uh, your uh, perineural invasion, which you see in sclerosing ontogenic carcinoma, which is unlike dysplastic amyloblastoma, as well as, you know, uh, some uh it has got a single file like or uh, invasive pattern of infiltrate or infiltrative pattern of uh, you know invasion uh then among the benign tumors there's been a lot of you know shifting with respect to amyloblastic fibromas so initially um, there were amyloblastic fibroma and amyloblastic fibrodentoma then in 2005 they became again amyloblastic fibroma fibrodent amyloblastic fibrodentoma and, and Amyloblastic fibrodentinoma. Now, in recent classification, all of them have been clubbed together under again amyloblastic fibroma. Uh, one important uh, uh, entity which has been included uh, is a primordial odontogenic tumor. If you see here, very few cases have been reported of these primordial odontogenic tumors, which is catching a lot of attention these days. So, starting with our first case. Okay, so this is an eight year old male uh, who have uh, presented with a swelling in the left mandible uh, over here. So, as we see, that there's an erupting uh, uh, first molar and there's a radiolucent lesion around it. And uh, if you see the radiograph, you can see mostly the there's expansion on the buccal cortical plate, whereas the lingual cortical plate is all intact hardly any expansion and uh, there is absolutely no cortical perforation on any aspect. So this entire expansion is on the buccal side. What you see in the histology is something like a dense fibrous capsule, which is lined by a uniformly, you know, two to four layered epithelium, which when you see in the high part looks more like a, you know, non keratinized epithelium. Uh, the entire epithelium is, you know, um, non, uh, the entire epithelium is uniform in its thickness, so ranging from two to four cell layers. And if you see the stroma, it looks more like a inflamed fibrous tissue. So if you see, there's a mixed sort of inflammation, uh, and a uh, few of the areas showing hemorrhagic areas, and uh, myxomatas and uh, inflamed fibrous tissue. This is just to highlight how the epithelium is. It's a non keratinized epithelium. You hardly can appreciate much of odontogenic or amyloblastic like layer. Uh, looks like a cuboidal, but there's no, no palisading, no detachment. In fact, few of the areas show somewhat like, you know, elongated ridges. So there is some sort of spongiosis in uh, the epithelium. So definitely this looks like an inflamed lesion. Uh, could be the primarily inflamed cyst or it could be secondarily inflamed. But definitely non keratinized epithelium, inflamed lesion, first differential, which is the most common, uh, which comes to, uh, and the, the first differential which comes to us is uh, 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 radicular cyst. Now, when do we call it as a residual? If, there are, if uh, there's a history of tooth extraction, then we, we can suspect in terms of residual cyst. Whereas when we talk about this particular uh, radiograph, so all these lesions have to be diagnosed uh, correlating with the radiology. Uh, we did not have any history of any extraction. Of course, it's an eight-year-old uh, child. 
Then a unicystic amyloblastoma can also sometimes, you know, when get secondary inflamed, can show uh, uh, a feature, something like a, you know, spongiotic kind of epithelium and non keratinized epithelium, which lacks Vickers and Golan's criteria, especially when it is secondary inflamed. Uh, then inflamed dentigerous cyst. We have to keep it as a differential when we are dealing with a deciduous dentition. Uh, so this is a young child. So uh, dentigerous cyst also becomes one of the differential. But yes, you should have two to four cell layer epithelium. Uh, but uh, uh, here I would like to state that inflamed dentigerous cyst, which now even WHO 2017 uh, admits, can uh, uh, show um, can lack that characteristic dentigerous cystic lining and can mimic your inflamed uh, radicular cyst lining like can show just non-keratinized epithelium with inflamed stroma so we do need to correlate it with clinical detail or radiology so if it is associated with impacted to then only we should think in terms of dentigerous cyst uh, then we have an entity something called as an inflamed collateral cyst so these are the paradental and medium mandibular buccal bifurcation cyst which are mainly associated with uh, uh, your uh, third molars, impacted molars, or first molars. And uh, they are the etiology is mainly the crevicular epithelium, which could have progressed and formed the cyst. So th just to give you some examples, how we basically rule out the, the cases, so just a unilocular, this is just a 15-year-old unilocular radiodescency with some root stump attached to it, uh, associated with the mandibular first molar. Uh, shows characteristic non keratinized epithelial lining, cholesterol cleft, some uh, inflamed stroma, inflamed underlying stroma, and um, something like a, with a fibromyxomatous, depending on what stage the patient has you know, reported. Uh, then you can have Rushton bodies or Russell bodies. So, this is a very clear cut case of a radiculosis. But what if you get a radiology, something like this, wherein you don't have any root stump? So, here you need to get a history of the patient so this particular patient had a history of extraction so yes same histological features non keratinized epithelium with inflamed stroma you just cannot differentiate radical cysts from residual cysts so this is a residual cyst which uh, which have a uh, you know these are the cysts which are uh, found at the site of previous tooth extraction and are well defined radial senses. Uh, but now we have uh, another lesion wherein you have a, a third molar with some radiolucency pericoronal to it. Uh, so this is associated with erupted uh, third molars. Again, same histology. So these are paradental cysts. Now, what are these inflammatory collateral cysts? They arise on the buccal aspect of the roots of partially or recently erupted teeth as a result of inflammation in pericoronal tissues. There could be two types, paradental, which are associated with lower third molars. Second one is mandibular buccal bifurcation cysts, which are associated with lower first or second molars. So this particular case, which we uh, saw, is a mandibular buccal bifurcation cyst. Uh, mainly, it is seen in the children in first decade, mean age is seven years. 38% are bilateral. Uh, clinically, they present with swelling and pain in the area of vital first permanent molar. Ma mainly, they present as a radiolucency from the forcation to the apex of the tooth, causing tilting of the roots lingually. Periosteal reaction may be present. So, the entire radiolucency is mainly on the buccal aspect, causing buccal cortical expansion, whereas the, the lingually, they, you hardly get to see any expansion. Uh, there are three theories which play a role in the etiopathogenesis. The lining may be derived from the dental laminaris or crevicular epithelium. It can arise from the uh, arises from laterally displaced dentigerous cyst of the first molar, which could explain the high incidence of bilaterality, which is seen in mandibular buccal bifurcation cyst. Uh, buccal uh, enamel extensions onto the tooth, uh, tooth root, cause periodontal pocketing, which can lead to these cysts. Uh, they are mainly managed through enucleation without extraction of the tooth. And the extraction or of the tooth and enucleation of the cyst are sometimes required when you know it is sort of hindering uh, the eruption. Now coming to our second case. Uh, this is a 43-year-old female uh, with a whitish bluish hue in the palate, but no swelling, whereas you see a small radiolucent lesion in the you know, premolar region. 
when you see the histology, uh, there's a uniform uh, looking epithelium. Uh, which is of uniform thickness and uh, looks like a two to four cell layer with some nodular thickness in between. Uh, this is actually like an on spot diagnosis, very classic case, and with the underlying dense fi fibrous capsule. When you see the high part, these are the nodular thickness, which can show some clearing. And of course, the most of the epithelium is, you know, uniform for two to four layer thickness, and you have. Uh, no. Okay. So these are just to show you the focal nodular thickenings and hypa and some clearing of the basal, uh, clearing of the you know suprabasal cells, some sort of detachment from the underlying capsule in most of the areas. Of course, they can mimic in this particular uh, slide to odontogenic keratosis, which have a tendency to separate out from the stroma. But they are mostly parakeratinized, whereas this particular cyst, which we are seeing, shows more of a non keratinized kind of epithelium. And if you see, the outermost layer is more of a columnar cells. So it, it can show columnar to cuboidal cells. So in this particular area, it, they are showing more of a uh, columnar to cuboidal cells. And they all are sort of showing palisading appearance, uh, which is again, uh, you know. Mimicking ontogenic keratosis, but in an opposite way. They are the, in ontogenic keratosis, the basal layer shows palisading, whereas this is the superficial layer which is showing palisading and columnar appearance. So this is the mostly the cyst is uh, lined by, you know, two to four layer, uniformly looking with some uh, epithelial plaques or epithelial thickening can show sometimes whirling clearing of epithelial cells. So this is a classic case of lateral pedontosis. They assess like a, always a on-spot diagnosis. And of course, whenever you're dealing with lateral pedontosis, you need to rule out dentigerous cells, which can also show, uh, uh, you know, two to four layer of columnar epithelium, non-keratinized epithelium. So, but they are always associated with impacted molars, where this lateral pedontal cyst has a very classic location in premolars, and they're never associated with any impacted tooth. And they're mostly smaller in size. And this is an uncommon type of developmental ontogenesis that typically uh, occurs along the lateral root surface of a tooth. So of course, the radiology would uh, help you rule out dentigerous cyst, and uh, which can sometimes show hyperplasia and can uh, very rarely mimic lateral parental cyst. Now, uh, these LPCs are believed to arise from the rest of dental lamina and represents the intrabony counterpart of the gingival cyst of adults, accounts for less than 2% of all epithelium lined uh, jaw cysts. Clinically, they are mostly seen in premolar, uh, mandibular, uh, mostly in mandibular premolar and lateral incisor region. But whenever they are seen in maxilla, again, the site is the same. Uh, sometimes they can be, they are reported in uh, edentulous sites as well. Uh, frequently occurs in the fit to seven decades of life and very rarely in less than 30 years. They are often asymptomatic and detected only during radiographic examination. So they could be very small radiolucent lesions associated with a vital mandibular canine and uh, premolars. So the, the teeth are always vital. So you don't have to, you know, uh, sort of get confused with, you know, lateral radicular cyst, which can also uh, lead to lateral cystic lesions because of the accessory canals. They can sometimes be larger lesions also, causing divergence of the roots. Uh, so they mostly present as well circumscribed radiolucencies and usually less than one centimeter. Now you have entity called as botryoidontogenic cysts, which occasionally may have a polycystic appearance. They grossly can present as a grape-like cluster of small individual cysts. And uh, th so they have a very typical appearance of a grape-like clusters. And when you see the radiology of botryoid, they can present as, you know, multilocular radiolucency, sometimes can present as unilocular, which microscopically can show like a uh, separate cavities. Uh, they are a variant of lateral parental cyst only. And uh, what they uh, what the, the suggestion is that you know the study suggests that possibly they are the result of cystic degeneration and subsequent fusion of adjacent foci of dental lamina res. Histopathologically, both uh, lateral periodontal cyst as well as uh, 
butyrate ontogenics cysts have a similar histology. They uh, they are a non-inflamed fibrous wall with a epithelial lining, one to three cell layer thick with certain uh, focal nodular thickenings, uh, uh, which can show sometimes swirling or you know swelling appearance of the cells like you they go round and round so that kind of not the thickness you can have you can see some sort of clearing a cell epithelial rest uh, within the uh, fibers wall as well as some clear cell changes could be seen in the nodular thickness and uh, the epithelial lining are mostly platinum squamous cells to cuboidal cells they're mostly conservatively enucleated and uh, this is accomplished without damage recurrence is unusual so coming to a third case is a four-year-old male present with the swelling in the uh, right lower back to region since for the past last uh, four months you see it's a it looks like a unilocular wherein the molar is pushed uh, towards the coronoid process and uh, this looks more like a central or uh, circumferential kind of uh, form of uh, you know uh, dentigerous cyst where it is uh, completely uh, encompassing a uh, mole uh, erupting molar um, now when you see the ccd there is a cyst like hypodensity with a cortical perforation on the lingual cortex as well as a thinning of the buccal cortical plate uh, this is the grass which we received. There's an impacted tooth along with the cystic lining, and you got a, a lot of tumoral or nodular like growths along with it. Uh, so, when you see the histology, it showed a more like a dense fibrous capsule lined by non keratinized epithelium, two to five cell layers. And when you see uh, the other areas, especially those, there are a few areas where the cystic lining was showing some sort of proliferation of the uh, epithelial cells into the lumen which are more, mostly columnar cells. It's just a high power of the same columnar like cells, which are proliferating from the epithelial lining. Uh, the cystic lumen showed uh, proliferating uh, sheets of those uh, tumor cells. These are just to show how the, this epithelial lining, which was looking initially like a dentigerous cyst, just two to five cell layer, but now is proliferating and uh, in the form of uh, polygonal to polyhedral cells showing a lot of squamous metaplasia. So these are the cells which are showing more of a polygonal and angular in shape and with abundant cytoplasm. And many of those cells have a prominent nucleoli in them. Uh, there were focal area where which showed more of a mucus-like changes, some granularity in the cytoplasm, which was looking like a mucus cell. So, uh, Okay, but predominantly when you were seeing looking at the lesion, there was a uh, there were a lot of granular cells with eosinophilic cytoplasm, some with uh, with nuclei, some without nuclei. There were also hyperchromatic and large nuclei, few mitoses, uh, prominent nucleoli in many of those surrounding nuclei with granular cytoplasm. There were also tumor giant cells, you know, cluster of giant cells um, which were you know sort of fused together. Then there were some cords of elliptical uh, tumor cells which are stacked together. So they are like sort of stacked in a line and giving it a stalked appearance. Okay, so something I am sure we all have gone across, come across this kind of, you know, messages that, you know, you have no clue where we are going to. We have a cyst with us with some sort of liminal proliferation. We do have squamous and polyhedral cells, but are we? Uh, do we have any clue, or is it some? Is it looking some sort of transformation, or are we looking at some sort of tumor, which is just presenting in a unique way? So we made the differential diagnosis based on the, you know, the most common ones first. So uh, calcifying epithelial ontogenic tumor, looking at the polyhedral cells with some hyperchromatic nuclei. Of course, it's an intraosseous lesion, so you have to consider the intraosseous differential diagnosis. So, calcifying epithelial ontogenic tumor should have, and they do show polyhedral cells. They can have hyperchromatism, like how we are seeing in the present case. Sometimes pleomorphism has been reported, like our case as well. But then they they uh, can they show a lot of mitosis as was seen, but uh, and can they have a prominent nucleoli? And uh, what is that cystic lining? 
So if it is a cystic lining or the cystic form of CEOT, they, the cystic lining would not uh, you know, mimic dentigerous cyst, but rather they will be a sheet of epithelial lining, which can have more of aminoblastomatous like of uh, appearance with uh, sheets with the, uh, you know, uh, which and the, especially the prominent nucleoli could not be explained. Uh, so, and of course, then the mucus cells, then again, that could not be explained. Then intraosseous mucoepidermoid carcinoma, could it be a transformation of dentigerous cysts to mucoepidermoid carcinoma? But we fail to appreciate any uh, squamous or epidermoid cells as of now. Then granular cells, because there were a lot of granularity, which was again, uh, you know, uh, we, we thought about the most common one is granular cell amyloblastoma if we talk about intraosseous location. But then it should show amyloblastic uh, follicles with amyloblastic, uh, you know, lining, uh, which, is, which should, you know, conform to uh, VNG criteria with palisading with a nuclear pushed away from the you know uh, basement membrane and subnuclear vascularization so we did not identify any of those odontogenic epithelial lining or those follicles and uh, uh, so that's how we ruled out granular cell amyloblastoma then granular odontogenic cells which could explain mucus cells but it cannot explain those proliferation of those uh, polyhedral cells and um, especially showing the granular cell changes and could it be some oncocytic hyperplasia or oncocytoma oncocytic carcinoma which can show granular cell changes or it could it be just a metastasis from some other site we did congruate to rule up cot which was negative we did ck7 for the mucus cells which strongly stain positive then ck56 highlighted the Poly, uh, those squamous and uh, you know intermediate kind of cells. CK19 highlighted uh, and especially suggested that it's a odontogenic epithelium, which is showing a proliferation. EMA was again positive, uh, and MUC5AC, which is a you know diagnostic marker for mucoepidermoid carcinoma, was positive. ABPAS uh, we did for mucin, but then was not very contributory. Uh, we did P40. Just to rule out the oncocytic hyperplasia and oncocytoma, which should show uh, mild or uh, uh, positivity at the peripheral cells, whereas this particular lesion showed strong diffuse nuclear positivity throughout the lesion. So we sort of ruled out oncocytoma, oncocytic uh, carcinoma, which shows peripheral staining, whereas our case showed diffuse strong nuclear positivity throughout. Uh, of course, the other lesions which can show oncocytic uh, transformation were wanthins, dermophic adenoma with oncocytic changes, but showed no chondromyxoid areas, no ducts. Then metastatic renal cell carcinoma, which can sometimes show oncocytic changes again. It was neg they are they are should be negative for P40, which is isoform of P63. So they are negative for P40 and P63, whereas our case is positive for P40. Uh, that's how we rule out salivary duct carcinoma and apocrine low grade intraductal carcinoma. Uh, so, this particular case is a intraosseous mucoepidermoid carcinoma, oncocytic variant with underlying dentigerous cyst. Uh, there was no perineural or lymphovascular invasion, and care 67 was approximately 20%. Uh, no areas of necrosis uh, uh, was seen in this particular area, and the mitosis was not much high, they were less than four per 10 high bar fee. So this uh, intraosseous mucopidermoid carcinoma, they mostly arise from mucus cells in the lining of dentigerous cyst with female predilection, mostly affects mandibular molar ramus area with cortical thinning, uh, can present as uni or multilocular lesion, sometimes can present with well-defined borders, uh, can be associated with impacted or, or uh, tooth or odontogenic cyst, and histology is same as a soft tissue counterpart. Mostly they are treated with radical surgical resection and 12% uh, um, have shown metastasis. The prognosis is considered to be good. Uh, it's just uh, as the same as a soft tissue counterpart of mucopidermoid carcinoma. Uh, it's a salivary gland malignancy which shows mucinous intermediate and squamoid cells, mainly affects parotid followed by palate and then submandibular gland. Uh, with a female predilection, mostly sick decay, whereas our particular our case um, is in a young child. Uh, they can show oncocytic clear cell and uh, sclerosing variant. And uh, what they say is if more than 50% of cells are showing uh, are 
showing these changes, then only we should classify them into these variants. Otherwise, normally also mucoidomic carcinoma can show these changes. Uh, so our particular case showed hardly any, you know, uh, there were very uh, less of a squamid or uh, 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 polyhedral uh, or, uh, you know, squamid or intermediate type of cells. Uh, we really needed the markers to highlight them. And predominantly, we saw oncocytic cells, so it was classified into the oncocytic variant. Of course, there are a lot of markers and stains which do help us in uh, diagnosing these cases, especially Pusicamin and uh, PAS. With dye stains, demonstrate the intracytoplasmic staining. Then IHC. Uh, here we need to know, remember that you know P63, which stains for basal cells, mainly intermediate epidermoid cells. Uh, then CK56 uh, highlights epidermoid cells. Pan-CK and CK7 are mostly seen in all neoplastic cells, but predominantly in ductal area. And of course, MAML2 gene fusion uh, is a newer molecule marker. So this present case was MAML2 negative, but still, uh, which could be seen in 30% of the cases. So coming to our last case, uh, this is a 42-year-old male with a swelling in the right mandible and uh, presented with a multilocular radiolescency in the right mandible with some pathological fracture, you can see here. Uh, so what we saw in the histology, there was a proliferation, uh, sheets and, you know, cords. So this is the entire sheet of ontogenic, it looks like ontogenic epithelium, which is sort of proliferating and infiltrating into the bone, a lot of hemorrhagic areas. We can hardly appreciate any distinction between the amyloblastic layer, which is present at the periphery, and the central spindle to squamoid cells. So they are sort of merging within each other. So you cannot make any distinction. And they all look quite dysplastic. So, so we could hardly appreciate any area which, you know, which can uh, demarcate these uh, columnar cells into um, you know, proper amyloblastic-like layer in these areas. Uh, there were focal areas which showed, you know, peripheral, uh, you know, peripheral palisading and nuclei pushed away from the basement membrane with subnuclear localization, which was demonstrating like a, you know, a which were fulfilling uh, Vickers and Golden's criteria and were mimicking and, you know, made us think that it is a odontogenic lesion. Uh, but they were mostly the ovoid or spindle-shaped cells with in the center. And we can appreciate some subepithelial hyalinization as well, adjacent to these amyloblastic layer. Then there was certain keratin which was uh, uh, which was present in between uh, in in uh, among these spindle cell uh, differentiation or spindle cell areas. There was few uh, superimposed ectomycotic colonies, and uh, there were abundant hemorrhagic areas with a lot of infiltration within the bone and adjacent soft tissues. We see the amyloblastic epithelium; it was all displaced plastic amyloblasts, displaying pleomorphism and hyperchromatic nuclei. And a lot of, uh, they were also showing some sort of spindle transformation. So that's one of the reasons in most of the area, these amyloblastic epithelium, they were just merging with the um, spindle. They were all, they were increased mitosis. They were more of a dyskeratotic cells and apoptotic cells in this particular case. So we made a differential starting from the most common again. We first rule out plexiform amyloblastoma. Then we thought in terms of amyloblastic carcinoma. So when we uh, uh, plexiform amyloblastoma, when we think about uh, plexiform type, uh, uh, it doesn't explain why we are getting so much of mitosis and a lot of infiltrative pattern with, uh, you know, uh, we can get sometimes in plexiform the spindle uh, you know, differentiation in the central stellate reticulum like cells, but increased mitosis and, you know, cytological ATP, which was seen in the present case, cannot be explained in plexiform amyloblastoma. Then we thought in terms of amyloblastic carcinoma, which should be environmental negative, which was also consistent with the present case. Now, then we have a differential of amyloblastic fibrosarcoma. So uh, the presence of amyloblastic islands Surrounded by spindle shaped fibroblasts of ontogenic mesenchyme is a very typical feature of amyloblastic fibroma, uh, which exhibit a pleomorphism and atypia. So, something like uh, amyloblastic islands, we could not appreciate. Uh, in this particular, we saw, so what we saw was more like a sheet and cords. Then, ontogenic sarcomas, the presence of ontogenic heart tissue like dentinoid, cementoid, and these cases. Uh, 
our should be environment and positive and should more show more of our uh, sarcomatous but our uh, particular case was showing uh, predominantly more of our mesoblastic epithelium showing the you know um, pleomorphism and atypical changes uh, again carcinosarcomas are one in positive and five same with the phytosarcomas we did ki67 which was uh, remarkably high uh, com compared to the mesoblastomas uh, which should show low ki compared to this particular case so this uh, we uh, case was diagnosed as spindle cell variant of amyloblastic carcinoma uh, spindle cell amyloblastic carcinoma is a carcinoma with proliferative areas of amyloblastoma as well as a spindle population which resembles fibrosarcoma but lacks the histologic features of amyloblastic fibrosarcoma there have been uh, histologic criteria which are given for this particular entity a carcinoma with amyloblastic differentiation and a sarcomatoid cell population intimately associated with epithelial component so you they often demonstrate a direct transition from the amyloblastic islands of atypical cells to a population of spindle cells that is separate from the background stroma so that's what has been seen in our particular case uh, so they are nothing but the variant of amyloblastic carcinoma which are rare ontogenic malignancy accounting for or just 2% of ontogenic tumors and just 70 cases have been reported so far. Uh, we do confuse them from malignant amyloblastoma, so, uh, which mostly do not show um, uh, atypical features like um, uh, amyloblastic carcinoma. Now, these amyloblastic carcinoma, they, there's no age predilection as such, mostly seen in elderly age group. And they, have, they follow the two-third rule, mostly seen in males, mostly in mandible. Uh, they have there's a racial predilection for blacks then they are an aggressive tumor with uh, perforation of the cortical plate and extension to the surrounding soft tissue can lead to lower lip anesthesia and persistent pain which is very much unlike amyloblastoma so i would uh, again want to emphasize that whenever we are thinking in terms of malignancies uh, especially when malignancy we need to have the clinical and radiological correlation uh, so they should also they are they are quite contributory. The imaging is quite helpful for diagnosing these cases. Then numerous recurrent lesions and metastases has been reported in uh, amyloblastic carcinoma. But uh, mainly uh, the they have seen that they metastasize to lungs, followed by lymph nodes. So uh, that exp that uh, you know justifies why early detection should be done using uh, CT or PET CT scans, and these patients should be kept for long term follow up. Radiologically, you can differentiate from amyloblastoma, though the imaging is many a times very comparable. You just cannot, uh, uh, you know, uh, you just cannot find, uh, you know, uh, differentiate both between both of them. But yes, sometimes definite imaging features like ill-defined borders really help you uh, if, if at all they are present. Uh, the borders may show a slight marginal sclerosis without periosteal bone uh, new bone formation. Uh, they can show loss of the minor dura and resorption of tooth apex. Yeah, so resorption of tooth apex could be seen in uh, amyloblastoma as well. But these amyloblastic carcinoma can have a history of either recurrence or they, if they are arising de novo, will have a very short history uh, or aggressive history, I would say. Now, in amyloblastic carcinoma, there is often presence of focal radiopacity, apparently reflecting dystrophic calcification. Uh, the differentials does include basaloid variant of squamous cell carcinoma. So uh, in these particular cases, there is absent of, you know, uh, jigsaw uh, type of tumor cells or uh, there is no stellate reticulum or cystic degeneration which could be seen in uh, squamous cell carcinomas. And of course, squamous cell carcinoma will show more of mitosis and ATP. In craniopharyngioma, uh, because uh, there's a similarity uh, with the ontogenic neoplasms. So they are present in mostly, the, you know, and they are mostly neural tumors, but in, especially present in the cranial base, but they're nothing like the calcifying ontogenic cyst. But they are also, again, uh, in one of the differential, and then malignant amyloblastoma. Uh, malignant amyloblastoma is basically, they, they just show metastasis, but they have a benign histology. Whereas amyloblastic carcinoma show more of a, uh, histological features of malignancy like atypia. So cytological atypia and increased mitosis are very important features which, uh, you know, sort of distinguishes it from amyloblastoma. But nevertheless, sometimes, uh, you know, amyloblastoma can show increased mitosis. But what they have said is that 
you know numerous mitotic figures is unusual and will definitely you know justify the diagnosis of amyloblastic carcinoma whereas when it is uh, amyloblastic carcinoma arising de novo they, they uh, you know th that that actually the microscopic distinction uh, from the amyloblastoma is not very obvious in those cases. In uh, 2017, they have especially laid down emphasis that you need to have the malignant features to call it as amyloblastic carcinoma, like increased density ratio, pleomorphism, hyperchromatism, uh, abnormal or increased mitosis, any form of invasion or necrosis. So any of those features uh, should be given more preference and mitotic activity alone should not be interpreted as a feature of malignancy, though it could be an add-on feature. Uh, but not the only feature and uh, uh, we should always consider the fact that mitosis are mostly more marked in maxillary lesions than mandibular so we should be careful when we are dealing with the maxillary amyloblastomas and uh, we should always be evaluating infiltration so uh, in uh, amyloblastic carcinoma so those are the features which are more important while when we are dealing with amyloblastic carcinoma uh, there have been diagnostic features which have been uh, given by various research groups. Uh, you can take the aid of any uh, PCNA, some proliferative markers, uh, higher mitotic activity, and KS67. Uh, second point being uh, nuclear atypia, like uh, nuclear premorphism and hyper basal hyperplasia, hyperchromatism of basaloid cells, and other features of malignancy like perineural or perivascular invasion. These uh, entities are treated mainly by surgery, which is a mainstay of treatment. Uh, and block removal with one to two normal margins is the safest modality. Uh, but uh, due to you know local recurrence, uh, which has been reported approximately 15 percent, some advocate that two to three centimeter of bony margins could be taken. Uh, adjuvant radio and chemotherapy is of little value, but uh, nevertheless, they are recommended in the cases where there is a positive resection margin or so multiple positive lymph nodes, extra capsular spread, or any invasion like a perineural or lymphovascular, or any advanced, locally advanced, or metastatic disease which are not amenable for surgical resection. Uh, to sum up, these odontogenic uh, group of lesions, they are quite diverse uh, because they reflect, uh, reflect a complex development of dental structures. We all know there are, you know, we have different structures which are present in the oral cavity. That also explains why they can present in a diverse way. Um, now, odontogenic, uh, these tumors, they, uh, especially they constitute less than 1% of all tumors and they show locally aggressive growth and higher uh, uh, rate of recurrence. Then epithelial mixed and mesenchymal tumors, they are uh, they have been designated into all these three types. So we always need to look into what we are dealing with. Are we dealing with epithelial tumor, epithelial predominant uh, ontogenic tumors, or you know, mixed tumors or the mesenchymal tumors? Because that also explains why certain component uh, is predominant. So these entities are very important to know in view of their differential diagnosis, uh, especially the ones which we have dealt with. So we have discussed about the medium buccal mandibular bifurcation cyst, which can mimic your inflammatory collateral cysts, the lateral parental cysts, which are very rare to occur, but they are quite spot diagnosis. We should always keep it in our mind that such an entity do exist. Carcinomas uh, can sometimes be very challenging because they do not show so much of ATPR as we are so used to seeing in oral squamous cell carcinoma. That also is, could be one of the reasons we can miss out on them. So we have to look into whenever we are receiving a resected specimens or you know entire specimens of amyloblastoma because certain areas can show amyloblastic carcinoma like changes and then they, there could be some you know out of the box lesions which could be very rare like the you know oncocytic variant of introitial mucopidermoid carcinoma so these are my references so with this uh, note that life is so much better when we focus on what truly matters. So we really need to focus on, uh, you know, what truly matters in a particular uh, case. Okay, And we need to collaborate everything together to get to the right time. Thank you so much. Yes, wonderful presentation. And uh, thank you. That was nice. Now we go to the questions. Yes, Dr. Somia, anything you want to add? Yes, ma'am. 
uh, that was indeed a very great presentation why wonderful uh, very challenging cases that you have chosen for this particular forum for and uh, to just a few uh, questions that we have uh, here like uh, in the first case that uh, you have uh, presented dr deepika uh, the median buccal bifurcation cyst uh, actually this particular case that you have presented here yeah, was associated with vital first molars and it was a bilateral presentation of the mandibular first molars so could we also think of aggressive periodontitis as one of the differential diagnosis in this case because this was also associated with periodontal pockets so can you just uh, explain something about this okay yeah thank you doctor thank you doctor samya uh, so yeah that is always one of the differential which we keep but here again i would like to state that you know the pathogenesis or the theories which they have suggested for the uh, median buccal bifurcation cyst is one of the uh, theory is through the cravicular epithelium so yes your cravicular epithelium which is proliferating which could you know lead to radiolucent lesion um, can mimic your uh, mbbc but here you need to correlate it with the radiology they very typically present in the younger age group leads to only cortical expansion of the buccal side buccal cortical expansion associated with a vital tooth not the uh, non vital tooth and yes if a periodontitis aggressive periodontitis uh, which mostly are presented with the molars in the young age this is mainly seen in the child but this aggressive periodontitis if you remember the age group is mostly in the younger adults and uh, uh, they are presents in all the four quadrants but uh, mostly in the all the four quadrants but uh, will they really present only on the buccal side will they have more like a cystic like appearance so all those features we need to you know uh, sort of put everything together for mbbc you will receive a biopsy in your pathology lab as a cystic lesion so they would have just curated out like a cyst and would have sent it to you with aggressive periodontitis of course you will receive it from the you know per, your perio colleagues so they'll not be sending you the uh, they'll be sending you more like a gingiva not like a cyst so of course they both have the similar kind of histology and that's what i was saying that there'll be so many entities which even inflamed uh, dentigerous cyst or you know your uh, uh, residual cyst all will have the same histology even you know many of the times unicystic can have the same kind of histology but then yes here you just need to have your clinical details clinical details with you that's going to help you otherwise you'll just label it as a granulation tissue which mostly i've seen that you know uh, many of the pathology colleagues who do not get the proper radiology or the clinical they end up you know giving it as a granulation tissue but and now we know that these are the entities which have the name so we should give them the name yeah thank you dr deepika going on to the third case that we have discussed that is a dentigerous cyst with the oncocytic variant of uh, mec um uh, to share with you all actually we also had a similar case but definitely not uh, an oncocytic variant a central mec which uh, arose from a dentigerous cyst so uh, this was an 80 year old uh, female however your uh, age group was very uh, you know young age group yes and uh, probably uh, in that case we even thought of a primary intraosseous uh, carcinoma arising from an odontogenic cyst so that was also considered as one of the differential diagnosis Uh, so uh, can we consider that as one of the differentials here too yeah primary intraosseous squamosal carcinoma uh, uh, when we dealt with uh, so uh, you know the uh, case it was I, I, i even we have reported dc with mec that's completely you know we we do back, go back to the literature and we get it and you know we mm. sort of it helps us in reporting this oncocytic variant is the first one which we saw and actually in the we have already published in oral onco oncology and this is the first case which has been reported of mm. Uh, mm. Uh, in the at the intraosseous location i mm. uh, uh, here i would say that when we saw this case we we have not left any literature you know uh, just to get to the differential so that we are not missing out anything because of course we had to label it as the first case so primary intraosseous scc we did consider uh, 
especially I would say that first initial differentials were squamous cell carcinoma because that's the most common one in the oral cavity. Mm -hmm. But then this was, uh, and of course, we were thinking in terms of uh, arising from the autogenic cyst which we could see that's a dentigerous cyst. It's been reported dentigerous cyst can transform into squamous cell carcinoma as well, along with, you know, MEC and ameloblastoma. So that's completely, uh, you know, justified. But for a squamous cell carcinoma, you should have a lot of mitosis. Whereas if mm. you see in this particular case, it was less than four per 10 high power field. So we could hardly see any mitosis. Then when it comes to uh, nuclear atypia, like, pleomorphism, hyperchromatism, we all have, we all keep seeing squamous cell carcinoma so often, like especially the oral uh, biopsy centers everywhere. I, I think so um, across the globe, that's the maximum squamous cell carcinoma we see. And we never see, you know, of course, well differentiated ones could be seen like that. But here we are not seeing any keratin pearls, which could think we could think in terms of well differentiated. And we hardly could see so much of hyperchromatism or pleomorphism to call it as a, you know, poorly differentiated. So there were no features to call it as a squamous cell carcinoma and not even poorly differentiated. So we didn't have so much of, uh, you know, ATPR to call it as a poorly differentiated. So that's why my first differential was more like a benign, like a COT, which was, which was our first differential. But then prominent nucleoli was one of the, I would say, the most characteristic feature, which was not letting us think in terms of COT, because that's a characteristic feature of, of mucoepidermoid carcinoma. Though we were not able to appreciate any mucous cells, it, we could see it only in the you know uh, IHC, and uh, intermediate and the squamous cells are also not so prominently seen, but what we could see were only the granular cells. We also thought in terms of GCT, granular cell tumor, which is mostly seen in tongue. So uh, none of the intraocious location has been reported. So uh, that's how we rule out squamous cell carcinomas and the other lesions as well. Yes. Uh, okay, there's one more question. Uh, okay. Uh, any of you want to answer, you can, huh? by the way, please. So uh, we have this uh, also from Dr. Akshay. So how common is a pulse granuloma developing in odontogenic tumors and cysts? And any experience in your institute in context to such an association? Yeah, maybe uh, I think if it is uh, operated previously, uh, they, we do get some cases which can show pulse okay. granuloma or vegetable granuloma. Probably if a case is not treated right away with enucleation, complete enucleation, and if you go about in a stepwise fashion, first you do a curettage and then you allow it to, you know, compress and then you uh, take it in the second sitting where you are going to completely enucleate. So in those cases, there are chances that the food material can get into the cavity and there are chances that vegetable granuloma or pulse granuloma could develop. That is the only possibility. Yes, it is quite rare to develop because uh, the treatment modality itself is surgical enucleation of the entire region. So, yes, as uh, Dr. Deepika said, it's quite great. True. Yes. yes. I think this is from Dr. Nasser about the mucus uh, differentiation. So, cysts do, but tumor has a differentiation as a part of the tumor. Nevertheless, inflammation can cause a lot of things. That is true. That is very true. An interesting thought from Dr. Harsha. So, how can uh, each odontogenic tumor has a special, specific and unique so does artificial intelligence and machine learning through whole slide digitization help in diagnosis of the lesions? Any of you want to comment? I think so. AI as of now in odontogenic lesions uh, has not been much initiated also, I would say. Yeah, the, the thing with AI for any lesion, for any group of lesions, one is it is very useful. Two is it needs data. So while we all sadly hold on to our data and don't share our images uh, freely, uh, then uh, as you know, we all have a sense of ownership of all, uh, all the slides and all the images that we have very closely held at heart, almost like we own them personally. So the thing is, until that is the case, AI is not going to work for anything because they need a massive, massive volume of data. So for that to work, and I hope the younger generation will go a different and a more open way than we have gone, 
is by actually making all your your slides and your pictures available you do not need to make them available so someone else can copy it it is very easy on the net to get a copyright but which is a creative commons copyright so others can use it but they will just have to say it was yours so that's what it's it's easy it's free you can do it on the web you can uh, put a creative commons it's exactly the way all our current journals even our own association journal is a creative commons uh, uh what i would say copyright which is why they they are free access they are open but it's not that the minute you you know publish your article there anybody can take it and do whatever they want with it that's not the case so really we need to move on this we need the next the younger generation needs to be a lot more open with what they have and also we need to begin to set up a lot of whole slide imaging because that's from where ai will really get the data the bigger centers maybe like yours uh, can actually begin to have the whole slide scanning uh, you know equipment microscopes and share the services with others that would really make a difference and i hope someone starts that soon so that is on the ai part and dr selvi karpaga selvi has a comment she has added uh, in case of perforated lesions with openings into the oral cavity pus granulomas develop due to impaction of food material that is very true i am going to share just one comment about the presentation that i think sums it up very nicely from dr shalin chandra who says crisp presentation as ever dipika very true Thank you, the picker. Thank, thank you so, so much. much. Thank you so much, ma'am, and thank you, Dr. Samia. And so, Dr. Samia, thank you also so much for all your contribution, for the discussions that you added, for the questions. Very well thought out questions. It was lovely having you here with us, and uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am, for giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts, and thank you, Dr. Deepika, for that wonderful presentation. Thank you. you good most welcome so that i'm going to say thank you see you all next week have a wonderful wonderful week see you bye 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 ma'am thank bye. you bye ma'am thank bye. you so much bye